Again, a friend of mine in the United States asked me a question, and it was by email. And it was one of those kinds of questions where if somebody asks that kind of question, it's usually of interest to other people, and other people may have the same question or a similar question related to it. So I prayerfully decided to consider looking at the entire issue. The question was, is the wedding garment in Matthew chapter 22, which in Greek is called the Eduma Gamo, is it the same as the garments of salvation in Isaiah 61, verse 10? So let's begin at the beginning. Let's begin at the beginning. Turn with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10. It's a verse we've quoted many times. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. Now, the Septuagint version of the first portion of this verse very much figures as very proximal to Mary's language in the Magnificat when Gabriel tells her she's going to be the mother of the Messiah who would save his people from their sins. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exalt in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation and has wrapped me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Looking at the second half of the verse, as a bridegroom decks himself with gar garland and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Um, a bride and, and, and a groom, the bride being the kala, and it says that the bridegroom would be decked in this wedding garment. That very much corresponds, although it is in a different testament, to a wedding garment that you see in Matthew chapter 22. That is the endumogamo, that you need this garment to get into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, so in that sense, already he's making a good connection. He's absolutely correct. We see it's the language of the wedding dress or the wedding, wedding garments appropriate for the occasion, and it's in Matthew 22, but it's also mentioned in Isaiah 60, so he makes a very valid connection. However, let's look further into this verse. He clothed me with the garments of salvation. Big Deyesha. He clothed me with the robe of righteousness. Notice there are two kinds of garments mentioned. There is the garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness, the garments of salvation, but also the robe of righteousness. Let's begin perhaps with a little bit of a better Hebrew lesson and a Greek lesson. Okay. The basic Hebrew word for clothing is begit, begit, or, or clothes, begit. Of a robe, the modern Hebrew word for coat is ma'il, is ma'il, ma'il. But let's go even further looking at this. There are two, the robe and the undergarment or the normal garment, not undergarment in the sense of underwear, just the garments of salvation, which are plural, and the robe of righteousness. There are two. Turn with me, please, to the Gospel of St. John, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 19.
verses 23 and 24. The soldiers, therefore, when they had crucified Jesus, took his outer garments and made four parts, a part to every soldier, and also the tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece. And they said, therefore, to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to decide whose it shall be, that they, that the scripture might be fulfilled they divide my outer garments among them, and for my clothing or my raiment, they cast lots. The Greek. In Greek, the word that corresponds to the Hebrew, big day or begit, is normally himation. Himation. It simply means garments, and it's plural garments. Big day, hemation in Greek. But then there's the word for tunic. This is the one that was woven from a single piece of cloth. It was not stitched or sewn. Would have been of appreciable value, most likely. That's why they didn't want to tear it up as they did with the outer garments. This very simply comes from the Septuagint transliteration of the Hebrew word for tunic. That's actually the modern Hebrew word for shirt, ketonet, ketonet. The Greek word is just a Greekization of the Hebrew ketonet. So you've got the tunic that was seamless, the ketonet, and then you've got the hemation corresponding to the prophecy of Psalm chapter 22. Well, let's look a bit further at this. In Psalm 22, 18, the word there, however, is lebushi, lebushi, from the Hebrew infinitive, modern Hebrew, to dress oneself, or to get dressed, lehit habesh, lehit habesh. It is virtually, or at least almost, a synonym. Almost a synonym. You get dressed with, or you, your dressing, your garmentation, your apparel, what you put on is the begit, or it is the ketonet, or it is the megil. I hope I'm not complicating it too much. So we see that there are two garments in Isaiah, and there are two garments in John's gospel. Why do we have the garments of Jesus too? The outer and the inner. The outer and the inner one. Well, one is the garments of salvation. When somebody becomes a believer, they are covered with garments of salvation. On the other hand, they get more than salvation. They get the righteousness of Christ. The righteousness of Christ. Notice, the outer garment never touches the skin. It is only the inner garment. Only the inner garment touches the flesh, not the outer garment. In other words, typologically, by illustration, we have no per se righteousness of our own. We only have the imputed righteousness of Jesus. We only have the imputed righteousness of Christ. We have no per se righteousness of our own. It is his righteousness given to us. It does not come in contact with our flesh. It is put on outwardly. But the sins we've committed in the flesh require redemption. Hence, we see these two garments. 
You see both in Psalm uh, 22, we see both in Isaiah chapter 60, and we see both in the Gospels. For the sake of brevity, I'm not going to look at the synoptics, we'll basically stick to John. Uh, let's look at this. Salvation is one thing. Righteousness is added to it. The Lord saves us from our sin that we committed in the flesh, but then he clothes us with righteousness. People have a problem since the fall. Most of you know this, but for the sake of the recording, I have to go through it at least in a perfunctorial manner. Turn with me, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 3, verse 21. And the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. As we explained in our teaching on the book of Jude, available on our website and on certain other teachings, the fig tree being another, the fig leaves are for the healing of the nations. The Jewish belief, the ancient Jewish belief, is that the tree of life, the Eitz Hayim, is a fig tree. That very much matches what the New Testament and Old Testament say, particularly the New Testament in the book of Revelation. The fig leaves are for the healing of the nations. Leaves have to do with good works, good works. And as we explained in our teachings, Jesus cursed the fig tree because Israel had to work righteousness. It did not have the righteousness of the Lord. He wanted the fruit the fruit of the Spirit that could only come from God. They only had the leaves. Now, there's nothing wrong with leaves. Without the leaves, the figs would be burned up in Israel because of the hot sun. They would never make it to harvest. You need the leaves. In other words, faith without works is dead. The figs would be dead if the leaves didn't grow over them and protect them. But it was not yet the season for figs, we're told when Jesus cursed it. The Son of Man comes at an hour you do not expect, that we do not expect. We have to be ready. He curses the fig tree. Israel had a work righteousness based on the Torah. They did not have the fruit of the Spirit. Hence, it was cursed it with it. Now, there's more to it than that. I only mentioned this in passing. What does Adam and Eve do? Well, they tried to sew fig leaves together to hide their nakedness. Their nakedness representing not being in a state of salvation or needing salvation. So they tried to justify themselves with works, as every religion does. As we pointed out many times, it doesn't matter if it's the Orthodox Jews who reject their Messiah doing the mitzvot. It doesn't matter if it's Muslims going on the Hajj or Hindus going to the Maha Kumbh Mila. It doesn't matter if it's Catholics going to a novena or Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on doors. It doesn't matter. Every religion is trying to attain or obtain salvation by works. Doesn't work. It doesn't work. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. The day you sin, you shall die. The wages of sin being death. Yes, there was an Adam, yes, there was an Eve, but as we've pointed out before, there are also pictures of other things. Adam was a man created directly by God without sin, but then he fell. Hence, Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus was, of course, pre-existent, but his body came to earth in the incarnation without sin. The first Adam failed, the second Adam succeeded. Separate but related story, okay? So we have this situation where fallen man tries to justify himself with works. God says no. He makes garments from them with the skin of slaughtered animals, types of Christ atoning for our sin, together with the promise of the seed 
of, of the woman. So right away, fallen man needs a new outfit. Fallen man needs a new wardrobe. Fallen man, fallen woman need a new suit of clothes right from the beginning. But we try to make our own with our works, with our religion. Always remember, as we say repeatedly, saved Christians do not do good works in order to get saved. We do good works because we have been saved. Our works does not make us righteous. It's the righteousness of Christ in us and through us that makes us righteous. Yeshua Tzidkatenu, Jesus himself, is our righteousness. The robe of righteousness, the ma'il stakani, does not touch the flesh. It's an imputed righteousness. Now, right away, we see this idea. But let's continue looking at this, the promise of salvation. Look with me, please, to the book of Genesis, chapter 49, verse 11. Jacob's prophecy to his sons and to the 12 tribes of Israel that outlines salvation history all the way up to Revelation chapters 7 and 14, but it begins in Genesis 49, as most of you know. The tribe of Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah in verse 10, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Shiloh, Shiloh, the one who is sent. Translated into Greek, it would be the apostle. A Shiliach, one who was sent, would be apostle in Greek. Jesus is the one who was sent. It was at Shiloh, the location of Shiloh, where the Holy Ark was kept for 200 years before Jerusalem became the capital. They're waiting for Shiloh, the one who was sent, to come. And to him shall be the obedience of the Amim, of the peoples, all the peoples. Okay. Now, it doesn't say Goyim of the nations, and it doesn't say just of Israel. It's everyone. He is Lord of all, although he would come to the Jews. Now, we've explained this also in the past about the scepter departing from Judah. After the end of the Herodian rule in Jerusalem and Judea, Pontius Pilate became Roman procurator, and he moved the capital, political capital, civil capital, from Jerusalem to Caesarea Maritina, to Caesarea, where Paul was. That's where Pontius Pilate's palace was. This is proven with archaeology and so forth. I won't go into it now. We have other tapes explaining it. There was a Roman garrison. The Fortress Antonio remained in Jerusalem for military purposes, but the capital, the scepter, departed from Judah. Now, there's more to it than that. It's not our subject today. I'm only dealing with it because it's in the text. But then in verse 11, his, he ties his fowl to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. Remember, Zechariah 5.5, 5, the Messiah was to come riding on a donkey. They brought Jesus to colts. Okay. He ties his fowl to the vine. And now notice it says his fowl and colt. How many donkeys did they bring Jesus? Two. Two. Okay. To the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of righteousness. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. Now, this is a prophecy of the coming of the Messiah of Shiloh. Okay. We see he's going to come on a donkey and he's going to be clothed in white. Let's continue looking at this. Uh, I'm sorry, in white, but what, but something to do with blood washing. And his, even his teeth are white as milk and so forth. You always see whiteness associated with descriptions of Jesus. On the transfiguration, you see it. You see it in the book of Revelation. You see it here. But again, that's not our subject. Now, let's continue. 
okay? You needed to have this wedding garment spoken of in Isaiah 61 and in Matthew 21, Matthew 22, to get into the marriage supper of the Lamb. Let's look very briefly at Isaiah 52.1 in the Servant Songs. Remember, in the original Hebrew, the Servant Song of Isaiah 52, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, etc. It is the prelude to the fourth Servant Song, which is Isaiah 53, the prophecy of Jesus' rejection, death, and exaltation. And we see this in Psalm 52, 1. Awake, awake, clothe yourself in your strength, O Zion. Clothe yourself in your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean will no more come to you. The unconverted, the unsaved, the unregenerate, those who have not been washed in the blood will not be able to get into the heavenly Jerusalem. That is the theme set in the servant songs that, that depict prophetically the suffering and glorification of Christ. But the book of Revelation picks up on it directly. You have to be dressed properly. Let's look now at Exodus chapter 28, verses 2 to 4, the priestly garments of Exodus 28, 2 to 4. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak to all the skillful persons whom I have endowed with the spirit of wisdom. And they shall make Aaron's garments to consecrate him to me, that he may minister to me. And these are the garments which they shall make. A breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a tunic, there it is a component of checkered work, a turban, a sash, and they shall make holy garments for your brother and his sons, that they may minister to me. These are, of course, the priests of Levi. Now, we are told that these are necessary. These are necessary for purposes of being a priest unto the Lord. Remember the prophecy, the Messiah will purify the priests of Levi. He will purify the priests of Levi. And we are told in Peter that we are a kingdom of priests. The Levitical priesthood is an Old Testament shadow of the priesthood of all believers. The Old Testament Levitical priesthood has its fulfillment in the Messiah in which all the people present themselves as a living sacrifice. They all have these special garments in order to be the ministers of the Lord. They were necessary, these garments were necessary for dignity and honor in order to serve the Lord. Hence, we see foreshadowed in Levitical priesthood and their tunic, what we receive in Christ, the garments of salvation as a kingdom of priests unto the Lord. The Old Testament, the Torah, being a shadow of the New Testament revelation of the Messiah. But then there were special Levitical garments only worn by the high priest, Hakohenagadol, one time a year. And they were worn on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement when he entered the Holy of Holies on behalf of the people once a year, which Hebrews tells us is a picture of Christ having entered it. Now, there was a ritual. Let's look at Leviticus chapter 16, please. Verse 4.
He shall put on holy linen tunic, a special tunic, and the linen undergarments shall be next to his body, and he shall be girded with a linen sash and attire with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in, in water and put them on. It's a very separate teaching, too long to go into now, but on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would wear this special tunic, not his normal vesture. Something special one time. After he made the sacrifice, he would come back out of the Holy of Holies and remove those garments. Now, the sash was cut in half, and half of it was tied be between the horns of the scapegoat of the Seir Zazel, and the other half hung before the Holy of Holies, and a lot of other things I'm not going to go into now. I would point you to our existing teachings on Yom Kippur. <clears throat> and... Uh, a messianic perspective and a Christian perspective of the rabbinic writings called Yoma. We learn about the background of these rituals from Yoma, although our doctrine, of course, comes from the epistle to the Hebrews. Well, let's understand this. When he came back out, he would put on his normal clothes again. These other Special clothes were used for certain things. Alfred Edersheim, the great Jewish believer, a great historian, shows us how these garments were used to make wicks for the lamps, the menorahs in the temple, and so forth. But when he put on his normal clothes and tried to go home, there would be a custom where the throngs of people would grab him and try to prevent him from going home. They would grab hold of the high priest and tried to prevent him from going home. And he would tell them, don't touch me, don't touch me, let me go. It was almost like a sort of a, not really a game, but definitely a ritual where you were expected to try to persuade him, and he had to strive to say, don't touch me, I'm going home. So after the Lord Jesus died for our sin and then reappeared in human form, not as our high priest, but as God who became a man, as the Messiah they knew. He said, I go and prepare a place for you, but they didn't want him to leave. And he said, and John, it's to your advantage that I go, because the Holy Spirit will come. And right now we are during the period of the Omer, the counting of the 49 days between the first day of Passover and the day of Pentecost, called Hag Shavuot in Hebrew. Um, we're in that period right now, but such it was, they didn't want Jesus to leave. Well, they didn't want the high priest to go home either. Once he took those special garments off, well, after he made the atonement, after he went into the Holy of Holies, he didn't wear those garments again. Jesus, the Lord Jesus, dies once and for all for our sin. Let's continue. This idea of these garments is a recurrent theme with a recurrent imagery throughout Scripture. More than we have time to go into in a simple Bible study tonight, but let's look at one or two. One or two. In John, I'm sorry, Judges chapter 14, verses 8 and Samson. Shimshon, Samson kills the lion, and there's the honey in the lion with the bees, and from the lion comes something sweet after Samson kills it. Now, there are different interpretations of this typology. Some say the lion is the lion of Judah. He had to die that we could get the sweetness. The sweetness is the honey, the devash, the devash. The devash, however, is made by bees, devora, devora. And as many of you know from our other teachings, a devora, the girl's name Deborah means bee in Hebrew. Um, devora comes from the word devar, as in dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy. It's called the book of dvarim. These are the things. The word of God is the thing 
in Hebrew thought. This is the thing. These are the things. The word of God, Dvarim, Dvar Adonai. The prophets would say, Dvar Adonai. The word of the Lord is the thing of the Lord. Dvar, Dvora, Dvash. They're all related. Remember the word. In Revelation and in Ezekiel, we see, particularly in Revelation, but also in Ezekiel, the word of God is sweet in the mouth, but bitter in the stomach. It's encouraging, it's interesting, it's tasty, but then we become responsible for it. It's a very enjoyable thing to eat, but if we don't put it into correct action, it can cause a lot of indigestion, spiritually speaking. So what happens when this honey comes from this lion? Samson says, if you can understand this, I will give you 30 changes of clothes of white linen, 30 changes of clothes. Once more, you see this idea with the death of the lion of Judah, or some would say it's the destruction of Satan. Something sweet comes from it. That with this happening, you get a change of clothes. The Messiah had to die. The Messiah had to defeat Satan. Whichever point of view you are inclined to, that had to happen for the bees to make the honey, for the word to come forth in its fullness and in its sweetness. But with that, you get the change of clothes. You get new garments. Now, I know this is a new way of thinking to some people who are new to us, old-time brethren and Plymouth brethren and people like that would have looked at, and early Pentecostals would have looked at typology a lot more than most Christians do today, but I assure you it is scriptural. Nonetheless, it's all a shadow of Christ. Let's look also at 1 Samuel 19, 24. Backslidden King Saul removes... His garment removes it and lays naked. What is nakedness a figure of in Scripture? Adam and Eve. Or what did Jesus say? By Sav and Laodicea, anoint your eyes that you may see that the disgrace of your nakedness may not be seen. They had a false sense of salvation in Laodicea. It was a problem with many of the Christians who were there or so-called Christians, and it's a problem today. They're walking around naked, and they don't know it. It's like the emperor's new clothes in real life. They think they're believers, and they're not. Well, Saul removes it. He's just naked. He's like like the Christians in Laodicea who are named. He's like uh, Adam and Eve. He's just laying naked. Yet he prophesies. Well, how can that be? Well, the same way Caiaphas did. Caiaphas, the high priest, was a conspirator. He was plotting to have his own Messiah murdered, knowing his Messiah was righteous. Didn't want to believe him as the Messiah, but he knew Yeshua was at least a prophet. And planned, conspired to have him murdered, yet he prophesied correctly, better for one man to die for the nation than everybody. He prophesied right. Be very careful, because God may use somebody in a given situation. Doesn't mean that they're dressed. They may have taken off the garment, but God can still speak or use a backslider in given situations. Now, again, it's not our subject now. But it goes more than that one garment. There's two. And this is what we see in the book of Esther, chapter 8, verse 15. Mordechai is dressed up not only in a tunic, but in royal apparel. Royal apparel. Now, Mordechai has the royal apparel, and King Ahasuerus has the royal apparel. The imagery in the book of Esther with the seven eunuchs 
from a literary perspective, very much parallels the imagery of Revelation chapter one. Remember, nobody can come to the Father unless they're drawn. Esther went before the king, but he had to hold out his scepter for her to come to him in the book of Esther. If anybody tried to come to the king without being beckoned by the king, it was a death sentence. But what did Esther do? We are told that Queen Esther literally got dressed. It doesn't say what she put on. The translators interpolate or they insert, they, they insert that she put on garments or raiment. It doesn't say that in the original Hebrew. It just says she got dressed for the king. Well, nobody can come before the king unless we are summoned. But when we appear before him, we better be dressed appropriately. Queen Esther, a member of the good women in scripture, prefigure the faithful church as the wicked women in the Old Testament prefigure the harlot church and false religion, Esther being a good woman. And she was properly dressed to come before the king. Again, foreshadowing the church in Revelation as a bride adorned for her husband. But that's not our subject now. One of those things we just point out in passing because it's in the text. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 27, we see when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out, their garments were unscathed. Their hair wasn't. Remember Jesus said, not a hair of your head will perish when they persecute you. There's a resurrection. Your hair won't perish. They were unscathed, and their garments were unscathed. In times of persecution, even martyrdom, not a hair of the head will perish. There's a resurrection. That fourth person, like the Son of Man in the oven with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the furnace was, of course, Jesus. Jesus never lets us go anywhere where he's not going to be there with us. He might not take us out of it, but he takes us through it, and he gives a personal guarantee we will come out unscathed. Not a hair of your head will perish. And it specifically says in Daniel, not a hair of the head of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was affected. Now there it is a different word because this is an Aramaic text. It's called Stribion, Stribion. It's Aramaic, it's similar to Hebrew, but it's not the exact same word that you use in Hebrew. It is an Aramaic term. But they come out unscathed, not just physically, not just them and their hair, but their garments. Satan cannot destroy the garments of salvation. Persecution cannot destroy these things. The enemy cannot destroy these things. Satan cannot do it. No matter what he does to us, he cannot touch our salvation. Nobody can take that garment off except us. Nobody can take it off except us. God won't take it off. Satan can't take it off. The world can't take it off. But like Saul, Lord have mercy, we can. And in the apostasy of the last days, that is going to happen. Nonetheless, let's go back to our text. You've got the general term, the general term. Now, in John, once again, in John uh, chapter 19, where it fulfills the prophecy of Psalm 22, 18, as we have looked at, in John, you've got Two words. You've got the singular, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the plural term, and then you've got the singular term. Let's understand 
what John is talking about once again in John chapter 19. Himation, Himation, the equivalent of big day, and Ketonet. It is interesting that it doesn't say it's it's clear from the text in context. It is indisputable that they gambled for the that they gambled for the ketonet. They didn't want to rip it up. Woven from a single piece of cloth, they didn't want to rip that up. Okay, didn't want to rip it up. But it doesn't say that they gambled for the ketonet. It says they gambled for the clothing. Actually, it's the plural form of the same word, himation, uh, himatisimon, but it's the same word. Uh, when it occurs in the plural, in, in the plural, it basically means apparel. It basically means apparel. Uh, I'm not a Greek expert, but I do read it. Uh, <laughs> I'm told by people who are experts that I'm pretty good, but I don't know Greek as well as I do Hebrew. Uh, and I don't know Hebrew as, and, as well as my wife does. Uh, my wife is a math teacher, but she also has a degree in biblical Hebrew and Aramaic. And uh, if, if I need anything, I call on my concordance. I'm married to her. But I, I don't know Greek as well as I do Hebrew, and I don't know Hebrew as well as my wife, so work that out. But I, but I am competent in the languages. Uh, nonetheless, let's continue. In other words, I'm giving you the basic things. In a lexical commentary, it gets much more complicated. I can read the lexical commentaries, but it would be boring to most people. I'm just giving you the basics, the essentials. Let's look at this now. This word for this kind of outer garment is called a stoleis, where you get the word stole, stole. Stoleis. Look with me, please, to Mark chapter 12, verse 38. Mark 12, 38. Beware of the scribes who walk around in long robes. They wear long stoles, stoles, long ones. Okay. They want to look religious. They want to look religious. God does not generally take a very positive view of religiosity or of religious dress. But now let's look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 11. And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed even as they had been should be completed also let's look at revelation chapter 7 verse 9 after these things i looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne of the lamb clothed in white robes and of course palm branches in their hands which has a meaning in itself we deal with in other teachings, but they are these stoles, stoles, okay? Same chapter, verses 13 and 14 of Revelation 7. One of the elders answered, saying to me, these who are clothed in the white robes, who are they? From where have they come? And I said, my Lord, you know, and he said to me, these are the ones who've come out of the great tribulation, Notice they come out of it. 
There is no pre-trib rapture, but that's not our subject tonight. And they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We are saved from wrath, not tribulation. The robes are made white in the blood of the Lamb. Because the garments of salvation require being blood washed, we can then say further that Chuck in America was right in making the connection. The people in heaven who get in will have a stole that was washed in the blood. So we have the marital imagery, and then we have the blood imagery. People are naked. They need to be clothed. The reason Jesus hung naked on the cross is he took our sin. As the last Adam, he took our sin. Our nakedness was put on him. His raiment, his garments, his righteousness, his salvation are put on us. He dies our death to give us his life. He takes our sin to give us his righteousness. He takes our nakedness to give us his clothing, his apparel. Now, again, these things are, of course, metaphorical, metaphorical. We know they're metaphorical because the Hebrew prophets said that, you know, it's not your garments, it's your heart. It, it, have your heart clothed in righteousness. Uh, that's what it's saying. But let's look, please, at this idea of clothing the naked and why we need to see it happen. Turn with me, if you will, please, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 3. Zechariah, chapter 3. Remember, the high priest represents the people. Now, for new believers, this is not Joshua from the Battle of Jericho. It's a different Joshua, the high priest. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Now, the angel of the Lord, known as the Metatron in Judaism, the rabbis have wrong definitions of him sometimes because of Kabbalah, but we know the angel of the Lord is Christ, okay. standing at the right hand of God to accuse, to accuse him. <clears throat> uh, Satan's accusing him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? That's how John Wesley described himself when he was almost killed in an inferno as a baby in Doncaster, England. Now, Joshua was clothed with filthy garments standing before the angel. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. And again he said to him, See, I've taken your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Then I said, let him put on a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. That's Jesus, or the Son of God in eternity. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and perform my service, then you will also govern my house and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among those who are standing here. Again, the faithful servants of the Lord are to be rewarded. But notice, he's standing there filthy, being accused by Satan, the accuser of the brethren. 
We stand there filthy. We are accused by Satan. Satan accuses God to man, and he accuses man to God. He's the accuser. He stands there, and he says, look at them. They're filthy. They're dressed in filthy rags. They need a change of clothes. They need a new wardrobe. Look with me, please, to Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 16. And you took some of your clothes, made for yourself high places of various colors, and played the harlot on them, which should never come about nor happen. What a tragedy it is when God clothes someone with garments of righteousness, of salvation, and they go into false religion and idolatry. We can think of whole denominations and churches that have done this. The Roman Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, mainstream Protestantism, and a number of others. Their forebearers may have had the garments, but they've soiled them in the way of idolatry. So you need these garments. We stand there filthy before our maker, and the accuser accuses us. And what he says is true. We are filthy. Filthy. That's all there is to it. We're filthy. Well, naked, try to sew fig leaves together, but it doesn't work. God had to make skins. Filthy. First you go to the laundry. Let's see. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 2, please. In Jeremiah chapter 2, we see the people are doing everything they can. Everything. And they scrub. They scrub with much soap. They scrub with much soap. But they cannot get clean. It just doesn't work. The stains don't come out. It doesn't matter. You read in verse 22, although you wash yourselves with lye and use much soap, the stain of your iniquity before me declares the Lord God. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot Scrub our garments clean. Putting your clothes in a washing machine will not make them clean. They're too filthy. The stains won't come out. You can manually scrub them with soap and with lye. It's not coming out. The human tendency, just as it is to sew fig leaves together to hide nakedness, so it is to Go to the laundry, the laundromats, the Chinese laundry, the whatever. Launder the clothes. And you scrub and scrub and wash and wash 
and the stains won't come out. No. Well, in modern terms, we have a way to remove stains that is superior usually to laundering. It means you don't use water and soap. You use chemical means, and now there's even other technologies involving light and things like this. Uh, dry cleaning. You need some other substance better than detergent, better than soap, better than lye to remove those stains. The soap, the detergent, the lye, the bleach, it's not taking it out. You need something stronger. Stronger. Forget the laundry. It's not going to come out. You need to go to the dry cleaner. You need to wash it in something better. I, of course, speak, or we speak, of the blood of the Lamb. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Forget the laundry, man. Doesn't matter how much soap you use. Detergent, bleach, lie. It's not coming out. Try and try. Our righteousness, filthy rags, just dirt and crud. A bloodied soiled garment is, 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 is the meaning, as most of you know. It's not coming out. Nope, you got to scrub it with something else. Something else that is stronger than our own efforts, than our own human capacity than our own attempts to make ourselves clean, something stronger is the only thing that's going to make those garments clean. Forget the laundry mat. Forget the laundry. we got to go to the dry cleaners. Forget religion. Forget trying to achieve our own righteousness and deal with our own sin. We have to go to somebody who has something stronger than soap. And that's Jesus. Those who washed their robes in the blood. But it goes beyond that. Let's continue, meanwhile, looking at this important subject. We have a message and a commission to preach the gospel. Remember, feeding the hungry certainly means giving food to hungry people. The word broma in Greek. But that is purely symbolic of giving them the bread of life. Salvation. A social gospel, good works, isn't going to save anybody. Now, we should do it, and perhaps it can open up a way for us to preach the gospel, but it's not going to save anybody. Nobody ever went to heaven by good works, by feeding the hungry. You never saved any hungry person from eternal damnation by giving them food. They can only be saved by giving them the bread of life. Likewise, clothing the naked. You see people running around naked and clothed and things like this, and they're cold and freezing and content. Of course we should help them. But any apparel we give them isn't going to save their souls. Might make them physically warmer for a while. But is it going to save their souls? No. Giving people clothing has a different meaning that goes beyond the physical. Look with me, please, 
to the book of Job, chapter 31, verse 19. Job. If I had seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or that the needy had no covering, there are people perishing for lack of clothing. There are people who are spiritually needy who have no covering, they're running around naked. They're dying from it. In hot climates, melanoma. In cold climates, frostbite. What's the difference? Both will kill you. They need clothes. They need the garments of salvation. Remember the faithful wife, the faithful bride, the faithful church. Turn with me, please. To the book of Proverbs, chapter 31. Well, there she is, and we know she's a faithful wife. That she is a faithful bride. For one thing, Jesus made it clear in Matthew 25 that when it gets dark, the faithful will have a light. Verse 18 of Proverbs 31, she sees that her gain is good. Her lamp does not go out at night. Remember, the wise virgins are ready for the bridegroom to come. They have a lamp that does not go out. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them and supplies belts to the trade. The scriptures speak in both testaments of the belt of truth and the garments. Notice it's linen. It's something that comes from flax. It's not a synthetic. It is not a hybrid of fabrics. The Hebrews could not make a garment of wool and flax. God hates the mixture. It's pure. Well, this faithful bride, she sells. Not in the sense of the word faith money preachers who merchandise the gospel. The scripture says, come, buy without price. Buy without price. The gospel is free, but it will cost you everything. <laughs> it's free. But pick up your cross and follow me unto eternal life. It's free, but it costs everything. Our salvation is free to us. It's free. It's the gift of God. But it costs Jesus everything. Buy without price. So it is. She sees the people who need the clothes. When a church is not mission-minded and not evangelizing, it's a church not worth going to unless it repents. But let's continue looking at this even further. Look with me to some of the other terms used in this regard. When Jesus comes out of the tomb, he 
leaves something. He leaves Othonia and he leaves the Soberion. The Soberion is like a face cloth that would have been over his face. But the Othonio was like, it's strange, strips like for swaddling or for bandaging. It's not the same term used for Caiaphas, I mean for Lazarus in John eleven forty four. There the word is Kyrias. They're almost synonyms as best I can determine. They're almost synonyms, but there's some difference. As best I can see, the reason it's used Athonia with Jesus is because as a baby, he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. He had the thing wrapped around him, swaddling. Okay. Even as a baby, he was, Mary was told by Simeon in the prophecy that her sword was going to pierce her own heart. He was doomed to death as a baby. But in those days, you would not have a a baby suit or nappies or anything like that. In those days, they used swaddling to cover a baby and a newborn infant. They used swaddling. Hence, we have that connection of the Savior who was going to come to save sin, and he was wrapped in, you will find him wrapped in swaddling clothes. He was born to die that we might live. Beautiful and wonderful. Hence, he has the Athonio. Lazarus, however, has a burial shroud, a kereis, kereis. Jesus would enter the tomb with these grave cloths. You couldn't really call them grave clothes. You'd have to call them grave cloths. When they put him in, he went in there with that because he took our sin when he died. But when he came out, we see him dressed completely different after that. Let's look at Revelation chapter 1. Remember, John the Apostle knew him, and I'm convinced John wrote Revelation. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, his head and his hair were white like wool, like snow, his eyes were like flame of fire. Okay, And he had this robe in verse 13, this stole, it, but it doesn't really say that. It just says, he was dressed down to his feet. The word stolios is not even in the text. He's dressed down to his feet in glory. What else? Look with me, please, to Isaiah 63, 1 and 2. Yeshayahu Hanavi. Who is this one who comes from Edom with garments of glowing colors and one who is majestic in apparel, marching in the greatness of the strength? It is I who speak in righteousness, mighty to save. And it talks about his judgment and the colors of his robe, uh, the outer one, the royal robes. Well, let's go further with this. Zechariah 3, 1 to 4. You're filthy. You need clean clothes. We all need these clean clothes. We go to the laundry, can't get them clean. They've got to be dry cleaned. 
they've got to be clean with another substance stronger than soap, water, detergent, bleach, whatever, lye, whatever. The only thing that will get them clean is the blood of Jesus. New garments. Put clean garments on him, it says in Zechariah. He clothed me with the clothe of righteousness. Well, let's understand this even a little bit further. Think of Yohanan Hamadbil, John the Baptist. What do we know about John the Baptist? Well, he dressed in the same outfit as Elijah in Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. Now, he was a high priest's son, but he didn't wear Le Levitical vestments. Let's look. He's dressed up like Elijah. Elijah, like Elisha, testified against the sin of the nation. So in John's, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 4, John himself had a garment of Hamel's hair and a leather belt around his waist. He dressed kind of rough out in the wilderness, covered with a, a hide of camel hair. Not exactly a tuxedo. Not exactly a wedding garment. Why? Because John represents the Torah. None born among women is greater than John. But he who is least in the kingdom is greater than John because he has an imputed righteousness. The man who was the most righteous there was under the law was John. But he who is least in the kingdom. John is wearing camel hair. The least in the kingdom is wearing a stole. John preached repentance, the Messiah's coming. He looked like a vagabond. He looked like somebody not fit to stand before the king. And he said that, I am not worthy to tie his bootlace, the thong of his sandal. The most righteous man was not worthy. He was running around with this camel skin, waiting for the Messiah to come and save him. No matter how good somebody is, they're not good enough. The most righteous person there is, the most righteous non-believer there is, of course John became a believer, but the most righteous believer there is, under the law, under religion. The most righteous believer of religion there is, like John, of works, of repentance. The most righteous one is dressed in camel hair. They're not dressed in a robe of righteousness. They're not dressed with the garments of salvation. Now, most unsaved people who seem, see themselves as righteous under the law or under some religion, no matter what it is, Orthodox Jews call them tzaddiks, Catholics call them canonized saints, it doesn't matter what you call them, the most righteous person there is that you can imagine under religion does not have the garments of salvation. 
Neither did they have the robe of righteousness. And John was the most righteous, and look why he was dressed. No, Joshua the priest, he needed a new wardrobe. Satan was accusing him. And all Satan had to do was tell the truth. Look at him. He tells the truth about all of us. Look at them. You're not going to hide nakedness with fig leaves. You're not going to get the garments clean at the laundry. But above all, to get that outer garment, to get that robe of righteousness that doesn't touch the flesh, that's nothing to do with us. You need one fantastic tailor, a precision made robe of righteousness. Ma'il Akani. Big day, Yesha. But first, the big day, Yesha. Then the Ma'il Akani. There's only one tailor, only one person who can give us that robe of righteousness. It's the one who took our nakedness to give us his own clothing. It is the one who took our sin to give us his righteousness, who died our death to give us his life. Forget the laundry, it doesn't work. You're never going to get it clean. Doesn't work. You're never going to be dressed appropriately for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Unless, unless you can say what Isaiah said by faith. Ki'il bishani big day yesha. Ma'il Staka Ya'atani. He clothed me with the cloak of righteousness, and he covered me with the garments of salvation. The laundry, the dry cleaner, and the tailor. Thank you so much for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash. 